And you, you really got to find out like what you love and who you are, right? And find your identity because your identity for the previous five years of learning is just all trading and all just frustration and, and being too hard on yourself. God damn, bro. God damn. That was, that was good. What's going on, guys? We're back with another episode of the After Hours Podcast. Uh, today, we have a very special guest. We have Jack Kellogg, who is super notorious all over Twitter. Everyone knows who he is. So thank you so much, Jack, for coming on. We are super excited to have you. Yeah, thanks for having me on, boys. Let's do it up. Yeah, for real. That's <laughs> hilarious. Hell yeah. So before we start, I have my drink. Jack has his drink. James has his drink. So if you guys don't have a drink, pause the video, grab a drink, <laughs> and let's get started. It's <laughs> after hours for a reason, long. right? That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So Jack, you've made verified $11 million trading, which is an unbelievable amount of money. It's an obscene amount of money, and it's an incredible amount of money. But a lot of people don't know that you were trading for a while. So can you kind of walk us through how you started trading and your whole journey? Yeah, I'll try to go over it kind of quickly here, just some some key points. I started in 2017. In January, I was at the gym, and my friend, he was like, yeah, I'm doing some uh, penny stock day trading, learning from like Tim Sykes or whatever, and... I was like, oh, I'll go home and check it out because I wanted to do something with the 10,000 that I had saved up from ballet. So I went home, watched a few Tim Sykes videos, and then really just scoured the internet, chat with traders, everything, watched all the YouTube content that was for free, and basically started trading in January. Didn't go well, was a <laughs> consistent loser for like 20 months, but I met one of my good friends, uh, Da Master Mateo, who taught me OTCs. And we started trading OTCs in 2018. And at the end of 2018, I started finding consistent profitability. In September was my first good month. And after losing probably like 15 grand, I, I turned a profit of 10,000 in September. And then from there, it was just stead steadily 10 to, uh, 10 to 15K for the next year or so. And then when COVID happened, uh, I just started trading bigger and making bigger returns and averaging somewhere around 50K per month for six months, maybe. And then after that, I started uh, sizing up even more. And my first big, big trade was CYDY in June of 2020, which was a perfect OTC uh, breakout and first red day. And I made like 80,000 on it that day. And then from there, I started to learn how to trade NASDAQs and NASDAQs. It's, it's still learning them. They're still kind of tough. But when the AMCs or the BBYs come around, I really put my foot to the pedal on those because those are the best opportunities. In my opinion, there's no crazy low flow action. And with the, the thick floats, you have a very clear stop. And with the low floats, I, I don't like to trade them. They're only good for like 2, 5, 10, 15, 20K max. And if you go bigger size than that, you, you potentially could just fuck yourself over really bad, unlike the thick floats. That makes a lot of sense. How yeah. old are you, by the way? I'm 25. 25. Damn, yeah. he's young. That sucks. That's yeah. crazy because yeah. when we right. first started talking, how old were you when I first met you? Like maybe like 22? No, I think younger, dude. I think I was like 20, 21 when we first started talking. That's crazy. Yeah, bro. I don't like. That. You said you were a valet. You were doing valet before. Yeah, that's how I saved up my cash through valet driving. I did valet for like four years when I was What's 16. What's the coolest car that you ever valet? I knew that was coming. <laughs> um, I'd probably say a McLaren. Do you guys? Do you ever see like any sketchy stuff happening where like the valet drivers would like like rip the cars around or anything like that or was it mostly like a normal i mean i was like... guilty of that a few times i mean some <laughs> of the guy i remember this one time this guy came in with like a brand new bmw six speed m3 Ooh. and he was like yeah bro it's a leash just rip it around have some fun i was like word <laughs> and i i ripped it around the city and yeah a few of my other buddies took some cars on the highway and shit but we played it safe. I've always assumed that they did that, but to kind of get it verified, it was just scary as hell. <laughs> it's a scary time. Yeah. That's funny. Yeah. So, Jack, I have a question for you. So you kind of, I feel like, you, like we know that you've had a long journey, but at the same time, I feel like once you found that consistency, you kind of got big like fairly quickly. How did yeah. you go about scaling your size? Were you like compounding? Like, were you looking at your account saying like, I'm risking a percentage of this? 
or was it all just more like confidence and feel? I would say a lot of it is just waiting for like that net zero moment where it's how much liquidity is going to be in this next one minute candle and how much liquidity can I take safely? And if it does go in your direction and you put in a large majority of your, like one thing that I do believe in too is like separating your accounts. So you don't have all your money in one account. So if something ever crazy were to happen, you just lose what you had in that account. Right. So after I made um, my first hundred thousand, I diversified my money into three different accounts. I had one account with 40, one account with 30, one account with 10 or 20, whatever, and then paid taxes. Um, and all the accounts went down a little bit more because of taxes. But I was really just looking for that net zero moment and that where you can strike and take most of the liquidity or the most uh, the fills in a certain candle and also there's something else that i like to look for which is adding to winners so you start in small to get a feel for it and then once it goes in your favor then you also can add to your position and move your stop down to break even and those are really like the trades that i'm looking for like i said i i don't like trading those low floats i just like trading a small position and holding for a conviction type trade versus the stocks the otcs and the bigger floats you really can size into them and keeping that that stop very tight and uh, make sure you're stopping out at an area where if it gets above it, then you don't want to become part of the trade anymore because it's not in the same uh, it's not the same conviction if it gets over a certain price. Right. Absolutely. So it's just really looking for that moment. How big of a how big of a learning curve was it for you, like for people in general or for you even for like sizing from OTCs to like NASDAQ stocks? Is it weird for you to like look at an OTC stock and be like, I can use like hundreds of thousands of shares versus like changing your mind and being like a NASDAQ, maybe using 20,000 or something like that? Yeah, I would just say it's it's all through feel, right? You really don't know how the your PL mm -hmm. is going to look until you're in the trade, right? So just by taking, I think I've probably taken like 6,000 trades in my career now. And you trade all different types of sectors, all different types of floats, all different types of uh, times a day. And through that, you can kind of almost like right away in a trade, like I usually know if I'm right or wrong in my gut within the first like five, 10, 15 minutes of trading it. And if I just, if I feel like it's off, I'll just try to exit my position for as close to break even as possible. And uh, the same thing um, with NASDAQ, it's, it's just the OTCs made a lot of sense. And the NASDAQs, you learn which ones work, which ones don't really quick because I've gotten into a few situations where you just blink and you're like, holy shit, I'm already down this much. Holy shit, I'm already down this much. <laughs> and it's just like, those are the ones I don't really want to be a part of anymore. Or at least I try to avoid. Yeah. So you kind of talked about like growing exponentially in COVID and kind of like finding mm -hmm. your footing. Would you say mostly it was OTC breakout that really kind of grew your account exponentially? Or was it just like other patterns in OTC too? Yeah, I would say the main thing, the main three are probably just uh, OTC breakouts was definitely the first one that I started with or just OTC gappers, uh, mm -hmm. which I learned from, from Connor, just NASDAQ gappers as well, where you're just kind of buying at the closing price and selling into the next day into hopefully a gap up and spike panic dip buys where a stock just panics at the open. Like for example, like SHMP when it topped at like a dollar, it, it panicked down to 50 cents within 15 minutes. And that was a, a great buying opportunity. Uh, where you can buy it at 50 and, and sell it at 60, 70, 75 with a very tight stop loss of, of 50 cents. So if you're getting in at 51, 52, 53, selling it at uh, 70, risking 50, it's it's a great risk to reward trade. And yeah, first green days after a stock fades for a while, I don't trade these on NASDAQs because whenever a stock usually pops um, after it's gone on a big run, it usually just has massive selling pressure. But with OTCs, it's a bit more clean where people like to kind of buy it back up um after it, it tanks this is uh shmp here um that uh that i'm talking about the run in 2019 2019 yeah that day that that day right here yeah, so these, the, are the, these are the type of setups that you're looking at yeah this was the ticker that really uh, really grew me uh i started think i think i started buying it at like five cents and probably sold it at like seven to ten then you rebuy it at 10 cents sell it at 20 rebuy it at 20 cents, sell it at 40 and just really just trading it the entire way up. But yeah, the first day I bought it was it was perfect, like double top breakout over five cents, sold it the next day at seven, eight, nine, whatever, then bought it again at 10, sold it at 18, then bought it again at uh, 30 and sold it at like 50 or 60. That's wild. That's a crazy chart. 
Um, yeah. When you're looking at these, like uh, how how big does volume kind of play a part? Like volume plays like a pretty big part when you're looking at these types of setups. Yeah, the more volume, the better. And I think it's kind of the same thing with NASDAQs. Yeah. And my favorite charts are the ones where they're doing no volume and it's a flat line and it has a spike and then it trades a uh, relative high relative volume for an entire month or two and then kind of breaks over that price. Like you can even see it right now, with like BBAI and SOUN you can see that they don't really trade. They didn't trade much volume before the start of the year, but after this year has gone on, you can see that there's, they're trading 10 to 20 million shares uh, pretty consistently. And this is a stock that I'm personally watching and like into the end yeah. of the year, if it can hold up these, this two area and start breaking over like three, four, five, this could potentially be like uh, a COVID type uh, runner. If there's enough gas in the market and, and AI can recover. Yeah, I've been looking at this one too. I already had like kind of like a line drawn like up in up in yeah. this area for whatever reason. So, yeah, no, that's super interesting. Uh, I think Alex had a question. Yeah, I was gonna say you mentioned Jack that you're looking for these ideal setups, not the low floats. You're looking for high volume, high conviction, high conviction setups where you know that you can size it and you're not gonna be, you're not gonna. If you have enough stock, essentially your slippage is gonna push the stock up or down a certain way. So you don't want to deal with that. My most recent memory of that perfect opportunity is probably Bed Bath & Beyond, right? That's mm -hmm. a ticker that I made a lot of money on, and I know that you made a lot of money on it. So could you kind of maybe explain uh, what you saw in Bed Bath & Beyond on the short, and then now what you're seeing kind of on the long setup with the Q on it? Yeah, for sure. If you want to pull up that chart, Harry. Yeah. Yeah, you zoom in there to the first run in August. Right there. Yeah, that, oh, that yeah, run. Yeah, big one. Yeah. yeah. So that was, uh, that's when this, I didn't really even trade it when it went to 50 or whatever, because AMC and Jimmy were better opportunities. Mm -hmm. Uh, but when this popped up last year, I ended up trading it and I was in Greece during the time. So I missed the breakout over, uh, 10 to 12, but it was pretty, uh, crystal clear when you see like the wicking action to the downside and had a nice breakout over 12. I probably would have sold it at like 14, 15, 16, something like that, and missed out on like the crazy move. But after it got super extended, I was I was looking at this for a short, and I, I didn't trade it the the day that it topped with the huge volume. But the next day when it gapped up, I thought that was a perfect opportunity to get short, and I ended up taking I, I don't know I was I was in Greece and I had like a few things to do, so I, I didn't stick around for the entire day. But I positioned myself with probably like fifty thousand shares short. Uh, probably from like 27, 28 after it peaked out at 30 and it just, it didn't end up fading. Like it had a few chances where it'd go down and then it came back, went down, came back, went down, but I still put myself in a position in case this topped at 27, 28 and then halted all the way down to 20 bucks, 18 bucks. And that would have been a massive trade for me. Um, keeping my risk within a break even spectrum. And then just the bad news hit and this thing got fucking crushed down to eight dollars and uh so i really missed that that setup actually my best trade on this was the long after it came all the way down and uh i think i i longed it from like 11 to uh to four or 10 or 11 to like 14 with like uh thirty thousand shares or something on the bounce and yeah. that was a good trade for me i missed a short on it because i was um i was long and i didn't flip my bias quick enough on that trade but that really opened my eyes up to bbby because of being able to execute uh good position sizes with tight uh, stop losses and then if you want to go into this year yeah so i was looking at this stock and i started buying this one i had a, i did a pretty good job i bought it at like 170 um just seeing that it was down so much and I was kind of just thinking that we could see some of these bankruptcy stocks run. It's something that Roland Wolf talks about, actually, is once these stocks come out with um, bankruptcy news and they get crushed, there's often like a big bounce. So we saw it with PRTQ, PRTYQ, which was like a 20 cent stock that ran to like 60 cents. This one is Party City, right? Yeah. Yeah. Party City. They, they were on OTC now. I think PRTY was when it ran. Yeah. Anyway, I saw that one run. So then I said, oh, BBY, BBBY probably has a decent chance to run. Um, so I bought it. Yeah. That first run at like a buck 70 okay. before the short. 
so yeah, I bought it in there on the first or second day after they had earnings and uh, I swung it overnight and I think I sold it at like 250 or, or 275 or something. And I left a ton of money on the table. Obviously, it went all the way up to, to six. Um, and then I started getting short bias on the top day, not the day that it, it faded, but the day that it traded around four bucks. And I had a, a short position on it, quite large. And But it kept holding um, the green to red area. So I ended up uh, downsizing my position for a small loss. And then uh, I bought it. And um, I ended up selling it at like five or five fifty, and I, I captured the end of the squeeze. So I took a good mature, uh, good ma majority of the, on the long side. And then getting back to Alex's question on the short side, when this bankruptcy piece of shit stock has <laughs> ran from one fifty up to six with four perfect days with increasing volume, that's exactly what I like to see for the big Larry setup, where it's trading massive volume every day. It trades more volume every day. There's more range expansion to the upside. And you're eventually going to get that moment where it, it comes in hard. And uh, that's exactly what happened. The big red day down from five to 350. So I got short in the pre-market after it failed to squeeze uh, red to green and then added at the open and uh, just started to risk the $5 uh, level getting in with probably like a 470, 475 entry risking about 25 cents. And then as it started to go down, kind of add a little bit and move your, your stop down to 475, 480 and covering it down into the mid threes and then reshorting it, the bounce up to, uh, I think it was up to like 450, 470, 470 or something. It was a perfect midday bounce, which offered an amazing opportunity to get short again. And then covering it into the, covering it into the afternoon fade. And I took a little bit overnight on the short side and I gave back a good majority um, when it went green the next day, which was unfortunate, but that's how I treated it that run. And then the next run was when it squeezed up like crazy off the uh, $3 area and squeezed all the shorts out. Then they did a toxic offering uh, in the after hours. And that's when I knew that Alex did really well on it that next day, shorting it in the pre-market thing just got absolutely smoked uh, the next day and just faded every single day since. Uh, but that's not really so my, funny. Yeah. it was so funny because on that first run that you were talking about, Jack, when it went to like five, I remember trading it. And I remember that it was just kind of testing five, coming back down to 490, testing five, coming back to 490, testing five, coming back down. And I was like, wait a second, like this is kind of looking, looking like looking a little bit sketchy. And then, like you said, it kind of had that afternoon fade where it just collapsed. Right. And that that was really awesome. But that day where it went from, you know, three to six or seven and it squeezed out all the shorts. I was like, wow, this is like amazing. Like I wasn't caught in it. I didn't trade it like this is setting up for like the biggest massive trade ever. And the market closed and I got like DoorDash. I got like some gyros or some, some shit. I was sitting in my living room watching TV and I checked my phone. I checked the quote and I saw that it went from seven to four. And I'm like, oh my God, I ran upstairs to my office, ran upstairs, shore the shit out of it around like, I think it bounced like five. I covered around like four. And then that next morning is when they had that toxic offering where it kind of just collapsed. And now looking back on hindsight, I think that day that, the collapse day in pre-market, I must have shorted like, like 200, 300,000 shares, some obscene number. And I was like, you know what? This is amazing. I locked in like 200,000 on the way down. And then it bounced like 50% at the open, reshorted it. And now looking back, I'm just like, God damn, like why didn't I just hold that shit, dude? It's, it's crazy because I think the stock closed around like 290 or $3 that day. And every single day since, it was just losing 10% a day, 10% a day, 10% a day, 10% a day. And it's just... It's just crazy because the amount of volume that this stock traded was obscene. It was an obscene amount of volume that it traded. And the fact that they kind of trapped so many longs on this stock is something that I don't think I've seen for a very long time. That's crazy. Jack, do you, when you're looking at these stocks on the like long side, for example, how do you deal with like, cause you trade some of the sector crazies and some of like the big runners and all that. How do you deal with like targets? Like, how do you deal with like, you have so much size and you're long this thing. And like, you know, when you're long, obviously you don't know how high it can go. How do you go about that? Especially because you trade these kind of crazy runners and all that. It, it depends. I either do two, two sizing options. I either do a, a small position where I'm willing to put in 10, 20, 30 grand. And with those positions, I just let them ride for however long. That's usually on the lower liquidity setups. And usually on those setups, like... 
I just, I get too greedy and sometimes they go up a, a bunch and then I'll end up only selling them for like a, a smaller profits. That's something like I ride it up like a hundred, 200% and then I sell it for like a 70% gain after it turns. Um, or something when I, when I am sizing into it, I only like to size into the, the liquid ones like BBBY and those ones I, I'm quicker to sell because sometimes you, you wake up and you're, you're up like 50,000 on like a sketchy long and you're like, oh, okay, this is good. But with, uh, like I said, the, the low float ones or the lower market cap ones, I still trade those and those ones are just wild because to make hundreds of percent on those like you have to sit through like massive pullbacks and you don't know like if that massive pullback is gonna is gonna get a bid and continue higher or if that's actually the top yeah you had a good trade on meagle didn't you like the this one right here yeah yeah i had a good one on that i bought that one at like a buck 50 yeah and i think i sold it at near like four or something and that was uh uh china sympathy right Yep, trying to sympathy after top. Yeah, basically, whenever there's a crazy, crazy mover in the market, like there's always going to be some sympathy play, and depending on how crazy the move is, the the sim that's how crazy the sympathy runs will be, you know. And when tops up four thousand percent, you got to imagine that some other Chinese piece of shit stock will get uh, some momentum. Yeah. Did it take you a while to get used to swinging these things, like long or short? Uh, was it easy for you to adjust to that and adapt, or did that take a while for you to get used to? It takes a while. I think that with learning like the swing trading, you need more conviction because there's a lot less oppor there's a lot more opportunities to like exit your position for a loss or a win or whatever it is. But you really need to have like this you're almost too convicted on swing trades, right? And that's why a lot of uh, people lose a lot of money or make a lot of money on swing trades, swing trades because they're so convicted in their idea that if it goes against them or if it starts to work for them, they'll just keep holding, right? They'll keep holding. And I think with swing trading, it's really about really trying to find that one trade where it's just, you have the right size, you have the right conviction and you don't drink too much Kool-Aid and you end up selling it at a good price. And I get a few of those trades per year, but for the most part, I'm just chopping up and down. Like I'll, I'll lose small or lose a decent on one, win small or win decent on another. And it's really that one trade. And for me, that, that, uh, this year that trade was GFAI. I think I bought it around uh, 20 cents and sold it up to near uh, like 80 cents or something and or maybe 60 cents. But I was really in, I was really right there for it. To, um, if it got up to like a buck or two, like it would have been like biggest gain ever. Like it just needed one more day of push. And I've, I've been in so many of those situations where it's just like, just give me one more day and then it tops. <laughs> Which one was it? GFAI? Yeah, it's before they, they did a reverse split and it's I don't trade it anymore because it's a low float piece of shit now. But it used to be like a thick floater or kind of thick. But uh, yeah, I, I started buying it to, to the left of your arrow, I think. No. Uh, yeah, right there. I started buying it in that area. That's just because AI was hot and literally it's just so simple. It was cheap and it had AI in the ticker. I was like, all right, good enough for me. So <laughs> I bought it at like 20 cents and... Uh, or at that on that chart i bought it at like seven and i i sold it up near the the top on the top candle up near uh 2020 20, 22 ish in the pre-market it was up near 75 cents and then they they came out with the reverse split news and it just fucking tanked i remember that actually yeah so sad <laughs> it killed Dude. i was so close i had like five hundred thousand shares or something holy shit Dude, we're, so were breakouts a lot harder to come by in 2022? And if so, was it easier for you to get your confidence back in 23 now that things are like really starting to really follow through? Yeah, in 20, I mean, 2022, really, it was the only good setups that I saw all year for like big size, big trades were like IMPP and HUSA and like that oil sector run. Yeah. In March, that was my best month by far. And then the rest of the year was me just trying not to blow up on the China pumps, whereas <laughs> it was either like a huge win or a huge loss on right. those liquidation plays. And that's kind of what I did all last year. And it's just so stressful, man. Like those plays, you just you blink and you're down like 50% or you blink and you're up 50%. Like it's super high risk, super high reward. And I've, I just started to learn like how to trade those and breakouts. I didn't even trade breakouts at all in 2022 because we're in a bear market. Breakouts are not going to work. Any breakout that attempts is going to stuff. And that's exactly what happened like on the, the Tesla situation where I, I remember Tesla last year 
it was trying to like it set up like a nice breakout around 300 and it broke out over the level and it was like on a cpi day and then it came back down and closed really weak and then from there it went from 300 to 100 dollars. and it's just almost like the opposite of like a bull market like on a bull market on a on a breakdown that's where you want to buy because it's going to get saved because we're in a bull market yeah that tesla uh kind of like that breakout over 300 yeah that's the exact thing i'm talking about there yeah. and it just came all the way back in so it's, it's just like the opposite of uh in the bear markets it's you you want to short the breakouts absolutely yeah did that hurt your confidence was it hard for you to like continue buying stocks as like breakouts just weren't freaking working and like coming into this year were you able to like hop back into it or was it tough at first uh i was able to hop back into it i don't really i think the the stock that like got my tingly senses started up again on the longs was seeing cosm i didn't participate in that one but it ran from like 10 cents to a dollar before they did the reverse split and all that shit of course and just seeing like how well that one played out in december and knowing that in january and february is usually the hottest month for these uh, penny stocks. That's why I'm willing to give it a chance to go long. Like even right now, like I don't really see too many potential like big breakouts. Like I said, I'm keeping an eye on the AI sector. I'm keeping an eye on Carvana. I'm keeping an eye on on stuff like that where just stuff that uh, potentially could get hot. Yeah, 100%. Um, when you're going long some of these stuff, uh, how often does uh, Catalyst matter? Like if you don't really see an upcoming catalyst, would you shy away from a breakout or are you like, oh, it has a good pattern. It has a good, you know, setup. I might as well give it a try. Or are you trying to think like, okay, you know, it, it's a sector play. So like, I know that this is going to go up type of deal. Yeah, I don't really look at catalysts at all. Uh, I think that's like the least important thing to me. The, the most important thing to me is volume. Uh, the second most important thing to me is the chart structure. And the third most important thing to me is the dilution. And then the least important thing is the catalyst. Because mm. I, I find that a lot of the times, if it's just, if it's in the right space, if it has the right price, if it has the right volume, like it's going to run. And I, I don't really like analyzing news because I don't know what's going to be good. I don't know what's going to be bad. So like the amount of PRs that I've read since I started my career is probably zero. Never read one. Yeah, <laughs> That's hilarious. So Jack, you make all this money trading, but what do you, where do you park it, right? You can't have all your money in a trading account. So where, no. do you, where, where do you, okay, you have all this extra money laying around after taxes, whatever it is. How do you invest your money outside of the stock market? Do you put it into real estate? Do you put it into indexes? Do you buy cars? Do you buy watches? What do you do to kind of diversify your income outside of trading? So that one day, if you decide, hey, I don't want to trade anymore, that you could just chill out. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, for me, that's, that's also what 2022 was because- just coming into even 2021, like my, my biggest period was was December of 2020 through uh, February of 2021. That was like almost half my my profits. Like that was like five million dollars in those three months. And it was just like, I, like, I don't know what to do. I've never had this money. My family's never had this kind of money. I don't have anyone to go to. Don't like have too many people to ask. So it was just through trial and error. And in 2021, like the first thing that I did was I gifted my parents a hundred thousand cash. And then after that, I bought like, I bought my first Rolex and I think May I bought my first Rolex and I bought a car. Um, but that was really just like buying things that were for fun, I guess. Um, even like the Rolex, like I didn't get retail, like I bought it on the secondary market. So I didn't really know too much about like the, the Rolexes and shit like that till now. And then last year I tried to, um, buy some stocks on the dips <laughs> and <laughs> I, they kept dipping. I'll tell you that. So <laughs> I lost a couple hundred thousand doing that. Um, but now I'm, I'm in a comfortable situation where I've diversified my money. Like I understand like the types of money that you want to put into certain things. Right. So the majority of my money right now is in just a savings account because that's how I sleep at night. Just earning 4% per year on a few million dollars isn't bad. And then what else I do is I have some money in bonds, two year, five year, 10 year bonds, almost a million into that. And that also pays me per quarter. And then I've put some money into certain stocks that I like. I've made a portfolio. Uh, I have some dividend stocks. I have stocks that I like, like Google that I believe in. I use Google all the time. I have some other like cybersecurity stuff and stocks that I've done uh, some research in. I have a watch collection now, four watches. I have, wow. I have two day dates, one GMT, and I bought my girlfriend a day just three of them or two of the day dates I both got for uh, re uh, retail price. 
or three of the watches I got for retail. And the return on them right now, according to Chrono24, is I'm up about like 27% on my portfolio. It's not great um, compared to like some of the other watch enthusiasts who get who are up like hundreds, 100% on some. But I'm trying to build my reputation uh, with my jeweler to eventually get the really sought after ones. But I got a pretty good one. I got the uh, the rose gold and olive dial day date, which is a pretty sought after one. I think it's like top five. Uh, it has about like a 40% return right now. It's uh, It peaked out at like 100K during the bubble. Uh, it's back down near about like 60K worth, 40K uh, entry. So I got that one and a few others that are not as good. Do you have any real estate or any, or have you been interested in that? Or you're just like, you know what, let me just stick to treasuries or. Yeah. He just did a flip with the, he just did a flip actually. Oh yeah. 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 I I have a company that I work with that um, one of my friends introduced me to and we, we flip uh, real estate and I'm getting into it. I I have some money invested, but I'm going to do some joint ventures and basically like their strategy is they just cold call. And they try to get people who just like can't afford their houses to sell way under market value that are like crappy houses. Like you're looking at people who you're, you're looking at only like houses like two, two hundred thousand, one hundred thousand, 100,000, trying to get them for like, you know, 30, 40 percent off and then putting money into them, re- renovating them and then reselling them for potentially um, like good profits, like maybe 20, 30 percent. So I'm getting into that, too. That's pretty good. What percentage would you say is treasuries, savings and like google or whatever other stocks you have yeah so i did a pie chart like uh a couple months ago i have i think it's over 50 percent of my money in um savings accounts i trade with 20 percent of my money through three different brokerages i have i think 10 or 15 percent in bonds i have a couple of percent in watches a couple of percent in real estate a couple of percent in cars and I have, I think maybe like five to ten percent of money into stocks. Yeah, it's always interesting because my my biggest question for people is how they diver- diversify outside the market because people think that, okay, you make all this money trading stocks, you're just gonna keep trading and trading and keep growing your account and account. And that's mm-hmm. great, but like you also want to set up like a doomsday fund just in case something happens. But what I really like that you said is you only keep 20% of your money in your accounts, which I think is great because a lot of people think that they should be keeping all their money in their account at all times. And I could guarantee that if you start trading in 2020 and you had a million dollar account in 2021, that shit is probably 50 K right now. Whereas if you had a million there, you pulled out 500, put it into stocks, uh, treasuries, whatever it is, you almost saved yourself from catastrophe. So I really like that you're doing that. And I think a lot. Yeah. Of- Absolutely. Jack, do you, so you diversify, but do you ever see a, a point in your life where you're not actively like trading as much? Like, would you rather at some point get into more swing trading where you're less hands-on uh, or is this something you kind of see yourself being like around for the rest of your life? Well, what I tell my friends is like, I want to retire when I'm 30, but it's, it's just difficult because like, I, I love trading. I know you guys obviously love trading and it's, it's tough to get away. Like, uh, I do a lot of traveling now. Like I have a lot of other like hobbies compared to when I first started, it was like only trading, only trading. So been just, uh, figuring myself out and growing. And, uh, also like, I think health, your health is the most important part of your entire life, like your health. So really just learning about health and investing in your own health is a great thing to do. Um, yeah, but with trading like days after, like seeing like what happened with top, And like that day I was, I was short, I think like a bunch of size from like 680 and just like getting squeezed on that thing. Um, it's just like, I I don't want to trade anymore after trading that (laughs) shit. I'm sure Alex can agree, but like days after that, I'm just like, fuck this shit. Like I've already made it. I don't need to do this shit anymore. And then I, I'm still grinding kind of out of that, you know, tough couple days that the market was, but it's, it just reiterates the point of like the stocks that I like to trade and it's just a good lesson overall. But with the, with trading, I I don't know how long it's going to go. Like right now I'm kind of doing the the Clover thing with a few of my friends, which is fun, like just teaching people and stuff. But with the, with actual like day trading, I'd like to be done latest, like 2030, um, and just focus on having a family and focus you know live live a simple life have a farm stuff like that not really do anything let investments pay for your lifestyle and, and focus on uh growing a family That's awesome. you know 
those tough days in the market are they're they're something else, man. They're really something else because you can't ever explain to someone, hey, I lost four hundred thousand, hundred thousand, two hundred thousand million dollars on one day. They're gonna let you stupid fuck. So I wanted yeah. to ask you, when those bad days come along, which they come along for everyone, how do you deal with stress? How do you decompress from stress? And do you have any tips for other people that maybe stress how they could, you know, improve that? Yeah, it was a big uh, problem of mine in 2019 and 2020 and 2021 because I just put so much pressure on myself to do well, uh, which also I think helped grow me into the trader that I am today where like if I had a loss, like just going to bed thinking about it all day, like how did I fuck this up? Um, and just like going over when I clicked the button a million times, like you fucked this up so bad. And it was just like, fuck, fuck, fuck all this shit. And I would be pissed the entire day. and I'd be so stressed out. Uh, and I, I got into this like habitual burnout, to be honest, where I would just feel like shit all the time. Zero energy, zero energy to do anything like lost, like a lot of friends. Like my girlfriend was probably pretty fed up with me, like my parents, everyone just because like I was so obsessed with trading and I was so stressed out all the time that I put that bad energy onto them. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's like been a big thing of mine ever since I, I had that, you know, huge three months and where I really made enough money to have freedom and to kind of do things that I want to do. And for me, like nowadays, you know, I, I do meditation with a coach. Like I, I do like a yoga flow. I go for walks every single day at 11 to get outside, breathe fresh air. And I would say like right now, like my schedule, I make sure to go fishing one time per week. I make sure if I'm trading at the setup behind me, I make sure to get off the desk 11 or 12 max and go for a walk, come back at like three. I make sure to laugh, right? I didn't laugh at all for three years and I didn't have any fun. I make sure to have fun. I make sure to go on trips and make sure to eat good food, eat healthy food, spend time with, with people that I love and, and good quality time and, and really just uh, have fun and laugh things off, right? Because so you're just now, trying to not think about the market. You want to yeah. kind of get away from the market and focus on life, love, and relationships. I know that you said that it's kind of draining and daunting to kind of bring that stress to your family and stuff like that. Because that's something that happens to me is, you know, whenever I have a bad day, my girlfriend understands. She's She tries to help me, but like nothing she says could help me. My parents try to help me. Nothing they could say could help me. So when you're in that toxic mindset where you are just like a cancer essentially to everyone around you because of your, how miserable you feel, how much you feel like you're a failure, how much you feel like you don't accomplish things. How do you push past that and bring that positive energy, not only to you or to the people around you? Because I mean, bro, I've been there. I've been there so many times and at least it's something that I still struggle with. So I want to know how like other people are able to combat that as well. Yeah, I would say just through like doing it so many times, just like being in like that toxic mindset, it only adds more toxic toxicity to my day. And I just I've been able I've been um, kind of like trading myself just to to change or, or push through almost whereas like it was so hard to break that toxicity at first, right? And it, just no matter what I did, like I just couldn't stop being negative. But through I mean, I hang out with uh, one of my friends, Ben, shout out to him. Um, he lives here in New Hampshire with me. And like the kid's laughing all the time. Like he's always laughing, always making jokes. And that's kind of almost spread onto me where it, like you just got to like make a joke about it, man. You just got to like just laugh. Like you just got to like kind of let it out of you. And but at first, the first thing you have to do, though, is, is pause and think about it, because if you just brush it away without taking that moment to it's almost like uh, when you stand up for like the national anthem, like you do it, you get you get done and then you move on to like the fun game or whatever it is. And that's that's what I do. I like that. Something I, I really admire about you is that you're very open and honest about this. I think a lot of people think like, oh, this guy's made a lot of money. He can't have any issues. He can't be depressed or sad or angry or whatever. So I think it's really just impressive that you're even able to kind of say these things. Was it something that you thought was even going to happen? Like when you made like your chunk of money and you're looking at it on, you know, your verified profits and you're thinking like, I made this much money. Like, how could I be upset? Like, did you think before that that was even going to be a possibility? Were you like, wow, once I make the money, I'm going to be super happy. 
oh yeah that's what everybody thinks right that's where everyone gets into it they're like oh i'm just gonna make this money and my every problem that i ever had is gonna go away but that's actually opposite like every problem that you're gonna have just gets amplified and i think that uh, after that like it's just so much work then it's gonna take like you another like year or two really to like like that's I, i'm finally at a place that i'm like super happy like this every every year now like 2022 was the best year of my life this next year that i'm living right now this is even a better year and like 2021 when i was the most wealthy like that was probably one of the, the worst years of my life just because i had all this money i didn't know what to do with it i thought there would be a, a golden rainbow at the end but the truth is like you have to keep digging and work and learn how to um you have to learn what to do with your money you have to learn like what how you want to have fun you have all these opportunities to do all these certain things and you you really got to find out like what you love and who you are right and find your identity because your identity for the previous five years of learning is just all trading and all just frustration and, and being too hard on yourself yeah that was a good answer dude god you know, damn bro god damn that was good i felt that one dude holy shit, <laughs> holy shit. Bro, I've just been listening to you preach, just like I know. Yeah. Like, yeah, like you're preaching to the choir here, man. Um yeah. so yeah. Uh I mean was I was awesome. gonna go over like your uh BBBY trade, but like it's pretty hard to like top that. I know, dude. Uh, I, know, dude. Holy, I still feel that dude. Oh my god. Good, man. Dude, I wanna do this like with you every week. I like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. Awesome. Uh, so, do you maybe want to uh, uh, kind of get into the, uh, this one, kind of what you saw on it, whatever? Yeah, I can get into this one. Um, this was about, I think this was about a forty-five thousand dollar trade. This one I took this week. I bought it on Friday and I sold it on what is that Tuesday, I believe. Um, and this one, I was, I was really just looking at it because after BBBY delisted, like you also have to take in consideration, like this stock is down from seven. Uh, down to 10 cents with zero pretty much significant bounces, except for that one bounce that it had from, I'm not sure, I think it bounced from like 20 to like 50 or 60. Yeah. Uh, yep. But this this day, like it's, it's down even more. And you have to consider like all the institutions who were selling it uh, for the past three months, like they're all out and it's really just left with like OTC idiots. Um, and I know I can make money on those OTC idiots because they're going to buy this shit up thinking it's going back to a dollar. And really when it, this doesn't show the full picture of the chart, but it was holding uh, 10 to 12 cents for a couple of days. And I just bought it into the close around uh, 3 p.m. Like I just started very small. And then as we were breaking out over 12 cents. I knew that I could move my stop up at first. I'm getting in at 12 with a very small position to get a feel, risking 10 or 11 cents. And as it starts breaking over 12, I know I can move my risk probably to around 12 because if it doesn't have a big spike and push, then I know that this entry is wrong. So it, it did have a big spike and push. And uh, then I took some more ads into the 13, 14 cent area because I know that if it doesn't gap up and push, it's also a wrong trade. So I'm taking these entries, which are basically risk-free unless I suffer a big gap down, um, which still could happen. And that's still a possibility. And then the next day it gapped up and pushed and I sold some of my position when I saw the level two turn. And then I added some back on when I saw the, when it turned back up again, knowing that I can risk the rest of my position on the low of the day using that trailing stop. Um, but unfortunately I got a little bit scared when it rejected the highs and then came in hard. So I sold my position or I didn't sell, I sold a small portion of my position down at 1735, uh, which was a bad sell. And then after that, uh, I saw how it was trading and it kind of felt to me that whenever it dipped, it got saved. And knowing that I knew that this would probably be, be higher later. So I, I added even more to my position, moving my uh, entry up to around 16. So it would be a break even trade if it did stop up, stop me up a little low a day. And it just went sideways all day. I took off, like I said, at 11, I usually take off, took off, put some, a couple hard stops in for, I don't put my entire position on a hard stop, but I put some of my position on a hard stop so I could run up to my computer if I started getting stopped out to sell the rest. And it went sideways uh, around 18 and then into the close again, it started perking. So I added just a little bit and then I sold my ad cause I didn't like how it moved my average up a lot. And then, uh, the next day, um, 
I just ended up uh, selling some at the open. And then as it started tanking uh, below 22, that was my new stop. The previous close price uh, I ended up selling my position and, and locking it in uh, around probably 21 average, mm -hmm. 21 five average. Yeah, it's a good, uh, it's a good trade. Um, you mentioned uh, seeing the level two turn. Maybe you could just like briefly talk to people about that. You know what you're looking for kind of on the tape. If uh, people are looking to learn just like kind of brief, I guess. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, with OTCs, it's different market making than um, it's not electric, right? So it's not like you just send your order through and it gets directly uh, marketed through electric route. And it's like an algo type thing. With OTCs, the market makers have to manually put in your order so you can see the turns a lot more clear. So you can see when a big seller pops up or a big buyer. And uh, basically into the morning spike, like you have to consider like people are kind of chasing this gap up and spike. And when, when a wall like doesn't budge, Right. When a wall kind of comes in and it, it just stays there. Like, I think this was like, um, I think it was 1875 was the top. And you saw like you saw some prints going through 1875 and you saw a market maker add on to the offer and another market maker add on to the offer. And then you see like the bid kind of start to chip off a little bit. And that's when that's like the start of a turn. And then when it turned, it came back in. And the same thing on the the. The long side is it, you see a dip and then it's it's tanking or whatever. And when you see the bid kind of stay firm, that's when you know it's probably going to turn uh, again upwards. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's awesome. Uh, does anyone have anything else? Uh, Jack, I was going to say, man, I like, look, we've, we've talked to a lot of traders and we meet a lot of people. But, bro, you're one cool dude, man, like for making all the money you make and for, you know, living the way you live and how humble you are, man. I just want to say, like. Shout out to you, man, because like this is the first time we're ever talking. This is the first time we're ever meeting. I know you know Harry, but I'm just really impressed, dude. I'm really impressed with the type of person you are. I'm really impressed with how good of a head you have on your shoulders, and that shows in your trading as well. And I'm just happy for you, dude. I'm happy for you. I'm glad you found that happiness. I'm glad you found a girl that you love. I'm glad that you have a plan to, you know, set up a farm and live wherever you want to live and start a family because I feel like a lot of people – uh, when they get into trading, they want to get rich as shit, right? And that's all how we all started. We all want to make a bunch of money. And now that you've made a bunch of money, you're not getting trapped in that rat race of I made 10 million, 11 million. Now I got to make 20 million. Now I got to make 30 million. Now I got to make a fucking billion. You're like, you know what? This is good enough for me. I'm happy. I've been through the downs. And now it's time for me to kind of focus on my life and my family. So I think a lot of people could learn from that too is everyone has a different amount of money that they – want to feel comfortable obviously it doesn't have to be 10 million it'd be fucking nice it'd be nice but you have to find that number whatever that is that kind of makes you comfortable that number that you feel that you know is going to give you that peace of mind and once you have that to realize that there are bigger things in life than money and for you that's a family and bro i just want to say like I'm, I'm just really happy for you dude i'm really happy for you yeah thank you man and i think that a lot of people, they they need to kind of get out of that mindset um, with like that that huge, like massive, 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 massive wealth, because that it's not I think getting like rich um, with a few million dollars, whatever it is, or even like a few hundred thousand dollars. I mean, that won't last you a long time, but even a few million like you, you really can do a lot with it. If you set yourself up with the right investments, if you set yourself up to do what you love. And I think a lot of people like they get into like this very, like very, very competitive. That's how I was at first uh, anyway. And it's just like once you make 10 million, there's going to be somebody with 100 million dollars who then inspires you. And, you know, they're yeah. probably out in Dubai work. with a ton of work. like Richard Millie's and they, they have uh, insane <laughs> cars or whatever it is. And yeah, I mean, that's awesome. But to get to that level, that's you're going to have to go through a whole new level of stress and a whole new and you're going to waste all these years where you are. You already have enough money to have this freedom. You already have all this money to eat whatever the hell you want, live wherever the hell you, you, you want to live, travel wherever you want to travel. Yeah, no, it's true. And just to kind of wrap it up is, do you have any questions for us? Like, I know we got to just bombard you. And bro, you put us in a trance over here. I feel like, yeah. I feel like you're mesmerizing. Like, like text my mom, tell her I love her or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> call my girlfriend. I'm going to give her a hug. I was like, baby, if you want to have kids, we're not going to freeze your eggs anymore. <laughs> do you have any questions um, for us before we wrap it up or? 
Yeah, I mean, I have a question for you, Alex. And I like I've kind of always um, like trading a lot of the time. Like I kind of you share your PL on Twitter, uh, which I uh, highly respect. Like you, Matt, as like you guys, you guys share your PL on Twitter almost every day. And it's, it's definitely super inspiring. And I always notice like you like I like how you trade, like you will have like a massive win on like the perfect A plus setup. And then the other days you're just looking for singles. You're OK making a thousand dollars. You're OK making two thousand, three thousand, five thousand, maybe on like a good slow day you make like 20 or 30 K. Um, and then the rest of the time, it's like then you're going to look for a huge win a few times a year or whatever it is. Uh, and I just, I'm, my question for you is like, how did you also like get to that, that place um, of execution? Did you just learn through your trials and tribulations? Um, great question. Um, it's actually funny because the last two days I haven't really traded because I didn't really see anything that, you know, mm-hmm. fit what I was looking for. And honestly, the most simplest answer is, I know it sounds so cliche, but bro, I'm not trading for the money. Like I'm doing pretty well. I got like fucking 25 Louis Vuitton boxes here as I'm saying I, this. I got that. a custom Thanos glove over here so <laughs> for me it's it's really not about the money because I feel like the money comes with the opportunity so my biggest thing in trading has always been I hate missing opportunity there's nothing that puts a pit in my stomach more than missing opportunity so for me just focusing on the day-to-day if there's nothing that's kind of there like you said if there's a low float I can't size, right? My, my biggest thing is how can I get size on this setup? On a low float, even if I use 30, 40, 50,000 shares, the wrong, the wrong entry is going to ruin that trade with at least 20 cents of slippage, right? At least minimum, it's sometimes more. So for me, I'm always thinking about what is the opportunity that I can just get size on? And if I can't get size on it, I'm okay scalping it. So on those opportunities where we have the Bed Bath & Beyonds, 300 400,000 shares I'm 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 notorious for wiring into my account for those setups. You know there was when GameStop was moving like last year or 2 years ago, I wired in like $300,000 into my account. I made 300,000 and then I wired it out. So for me I'm always thinking about can I get size on this setup? And if I can't get size on this setup due to the flow or due to the opportunity, I'm just like it's not really worth my time, so I'm just scalping around. It's like for me it's like Like I'm practicing on games. Like there's season games that you just play and play and play, but the big ones are the playoffs. So I'm always looking for those playoff type opportunities to really bulldoze in. And if not, I'm just treating it as like a regular season game. Thousand dollars, two thousand dollars, five thousand dollars isn't gonna really change my life. It's really like I know it's sucks, it's stupid to say, but it's not gonna change my life. So I don't really think about it. And because I'm not thinking about it, I don't really care about it. But I'm pretty much just really, really, really waiting for those, like you said, those high probability setups where I could get a shitload of size on and then just focus. Because without that liquidity, without that opportunity, it's for me, it's not even worth it. It's not even worth it. Like scalping around every single day is just like I'm like going to the gym and exercising. I'm practicing. I'm practicing. I'm practicing every single day, every single day, every single day. So that when that playoff, that Super Bowl comes, that I'm still in practice whereas if i just fucked off for a couple months waited for the indos you'll fuck it up geez i'm gonna screw it up i'm gonna screw yeah. it up so it's pretty much just like me practicing i'm i'm getting paid to essentially practice and stay in tip top uh mental physical executional shape just so that when that opportunity comes i'm gonna fucking attack it yeah i agree 100 percent with what you said there and that's kind of how i look at it too um, and I, I didn't trade today either. Like I didn't see anything. I didn't trade yesterday. I just exited a couple swing trades and kind of feels like the market shifting a little bit from like the last four weeks have been pretty good. So we're probably going to go through a slow cycle the next, the next month or so, just kind of always having that, what the market kind of should be also in the back of my head. Uh, but also I tried the not trading for a month and then waiting for a perfect setup and then going in and, and, I fucked it up so bad. It was LWLG OTC runner ran from like a buck to like 20 bucks shorted a bunch of size. And, uh, it, I ended up, I was shorting it on the top day, but I was a little bit too early and I got squeezed out and I probably lost like 50 grand or something in 2021. It was like may or June or something. And it was just so frustrating because I waited all this time and I was super disciplined just to lose money. So after that, after that happened to me, 
which I assume you probably went through something similar where you tried not trading and then you fucked up a good opportunity. Yeah. Then it's just about having those small wins. Like you said, that's keeping you um, in the game. And it's also keeping your, your skills tight because those millisecond decisions that we have to make on the big setups or whatever it is, uh, they're really what's going to dictate how much we get paid that year. And if you're, if your timing's off by 10 seconds, because you haven't made any trading in the last month or two, like you're just, we all know what a good setup is, right? But if we're not trading, we can't execute. And you get FOMO too. Imagine you're not trading and you're not making money and you're like, okay, this is the one that I'm coming back for you're too early <laughs> all my size. And all of a sudden it just like does the complete inverse. So I think that being a professional trader means that you do have to show up every day. You don't have to trade crazy size every day. You don't have to size up every day. You don't have to go crazy every day, but just staying in the market and understanding the kind of cycles that we're in understanding what is kind of going on because you may come, you may, you may take off in the market and then something like top happens and you're like, oh my God, I'm going to short the shit out of this top. It's going to go this, that. And then all of a sudden you get squeezed. But if you're in the market and you know, all right, we just had the AI sector. We're going to have the China sector. After the China sector, there's going to be a sympathy play MEGL. There's going to be sympathy play XYZ. It kind of keeps you in practice or it keeps you in tune with the market to be able to say, all right, like this just happened. So now that is going to happen. And if you're not in tune with the market, if you're just kind of screwing off, you're going to miss that little, I guess, intuition that comes along with the screen time of seeing these things occur over and over again. Yeah. No, hundred percent, hundred percent. That's how you, that's how you make a lot of money, right? That's uh, you got to size up on the best opportunities and you also got to stay sharp. Yep. Yeah, and make sure those losses are small. It's like, bro, I was actually, it's funny because like after crazy shit with Top happened, I was like going through my stats and just like looking through, all right, like what if I just like, like what if I just eliminated all these losers? Just like out of curiosity, I was like, what, what would happen if like I just got all these losses out of my, like out of the equation? Like what would have happened if they just never existed? And like it's literally millions and millions of dollars, dude. It's like millions and upon millions upon millions of dollars. So like something that I want to work on. And Top was an, abnormality because like it halted the liquidity like all this shit was insane but you know just as a trader i mean if you guys are watching this and you guys want to know how to make more money trading the way to make more money trading is not to make more money trading it's to lose less money trading so if you could find a way to control your losses through broker limits hard stops max size max loss that in and of itself is going to lead to more profitability in the future yeah, I agree. Like I've, uh, I've taken, I've probably have made the round like 22 million, but I've lost like $10 million in my like career. And I've like the amount of like 300 K losses. Like I've had a few 300 K losses, like a few, like I've probably had like 10, maybe over a hundred K, maybe 15. I'm not sure exactly what it is, but it's, it's really those like 300, 400 K losses. Um, that just, you know, they're taking up the majority of my year. Like, th think about it. I've made, I've made uh, good money this year. I think I'm up uh, like maybe 1.6 or 1.7 million. And I think um, like four, like I've I probably lost like six hundred thousand dollars shorting, and I've probably tops like four hundred thousand of that. Um, which is literally like my shorting stats were insane this year. When I was looking at them, I was like, I'm, I'm killing it. I got like a 6.0 profit factor. I'm making so much money shorting, but it really just takes that one huge loss to reset all your stats back to like a two profit factor. Right. Yeah. And I always, like, I can always feel it coming too because when my profit factor gets too insane, like when I'm making like over five, five to 10, like I remember in the bubble, my long profit factor was like 12. Like you're just making all this money. You're never losing. But that one stock comes along and since you're making so much money, you're like, OK, like I can wait a little bit because yeah. overconfidence, <laughs> overconfidence. I, I can wait a little bit. Like I can wait for this to come back down. I think I'm still right. And then it, if you add more, that's when you get fucked and then it goes against you and you lose huge. Um, and there is one more point that I wanted to make, but I, I completely forgot. <laughs> Well, good. If you're ever in New Jersey, New York, bro, I got to take you out for the fattest tomahawk you've ever seen in your life. Yeah. 
<laughs> I love steak, Dollar. man. Steak and wine. <laughs> Bro, you're gonna, you're gonna, I'm gonna take you to a place where they're gonna fucking pick the, you're gonna pick the cow that you want to eat that day. That's the first <laughs> you're gonna go to. That's sick, dude. Yeah, yeah, I'll definitely hit you up. And, and again, bro, I really appreciate you coming on here. This is this is just really special to be in the presence of other people that not only understand trading, that have made a lot of money trading and are not fucking douchebags, dude. Like as simple as it sounds. Like it's just really, really nice because the market has a way of humbling you. And no trader that's ever made millions of dollars has not been humbled by the market. So you could always tell who's a great trader, a real trader, and a profitable trader by how humble they are, because if they are not, they have not been humbled and they have not learned that lesson to take them to the next level. So I want to say thank you, bro. Thank you for coming on here. Yeah. Thank you for thank you. not only inspiring me, but inspiring the people that watch. And I wish you nothing but success, bro. I hope you have the greatest family and healthiest family. And I hope you live a lifelong full of happiness. Thanks, man. Yeah, it's really nice to meet you, Alex. James, I know we've talked before. Harry, you're the fucking man. <laughs> <laughs> Love you, bro. Love All right. Well, I think that wraps it up. Thank you. I'm lagging pretty you, hard. <laughs> yeah, Harry's not lagging. You got no screen, buddy. <laughs> He's not even Harry. It's his avatar. <laughs> <laughs>